G'day, I'm Warwick Scheller and welcome back to the Principles of Training. Today we're going to take another look at the last principle we looked at which is called Don't Go to Bed Angry. So in the last episode we looked at the principle of don't go to bed angry and how important it is training horses and as I mentioned in that one, you know, at everybody's wedding they always get told by an older wiser person don't go to bed angry and what they really mean is if any tension builds up between the two of you during the day get rid of it, sit down, talk it out, make it go away. Because if you don't let it build up, you can't bring it up at other times and your, your small arguments don't turn into big ones. It's exactly the same training horses. And you know, for many years I trained reining horses and then towards the end of it, I started getting a lot of problem horses in to solve their problems, you know, to retrain them. Bucking, bolting, rearing, all those sorts of things, with all different breeds of horses, warm bloods, you know, I had some dressage horses, I had aventers, I had, you know, Andalusians, Arabian, thoroughbreds, all different types of breeds. And probably the, the most common problem they all had was they had no reset button, they had no emotional intelligence, they had no way to control their emotions. They, they let things build up inside them. And so, you know, they'd be anxious when you got them out and then you put the saddle on, they get more anxious and then someone gets on a ride and they get more anxious and then pretty soon something happens and they're bucking, rearing and bolting. And so when I uh, problem solve those sorts of horses, I always go back to the beginning, the same as if they had no problems and they were being started in the first place. I start doing groundwork and as I talked about last time, there's two parts to that groundwork. You're either sensitizing them or desensitizing them. Okay, and sensitizing them is asking them to do something, getting them responsive. The desensitizing them is making sure that the thing you just got them responsive to is not bothering them. And that's a huge part of getting them back down. You know, a uh, favorite quote of mine from Nuno Oliveira is your horse needs to be relaxed yet remain powerful and that is a very very difficult thing to do get a horse that is powerful and ready to do things but be relaxed waiting for it and that's that's really hard to do and I think there's a whole lot of don't go to bed angry involved in that because every time you get a horse responsive or powerful as Nuno Oliveira likes to call it once you get them responsive and have engagement and propulsion and forward you will tend to get a bit of worry and so all the way along in our training we're trying to teach those horses how to come back down from that worry and so when I'm doing groundwork with a horse you know anytime I'm asking them to do something like sensitizing say with Bundy here if I ask Bundy to go off to my left and you might notice when I go like that Bundy doesn't go okay he's not moving when I do that because that's not part of the cue he's, he's still relaxed but if that lead rope was attached to my hand and I did that he would go so he was relaxed yet responsive okay and so how you go about asking for things has a lot to do with that and a later a later episode we'll talk about the um, the application of your age and the order of your cues we're not going to really get into that right now but so you're trying to get those horses to where they are responsive and relaxed at the same time and all of the sensitizing like I have said gets them responsive it's the desensitizing it's the it's the having them come back down after you do something that gets them relaxed again and, and uh, like I said last time it's just a it's a balancing act going from one to the other trying to get that happening something I suggest you guys do is anytime you use a tool to get your horse responsive you want to make sure that your horse is not worried about that tool afterwards so if I was to use this flag to back up my ask and this flag it might look strange to some of you but it's basically a flappy dressage whip is what it is. It's an artificial aid. It's something you use to back up your ass. So if I ask Bundy to go and he doesn't go, I will wave this until he goes and when he goes then I'll stop asking. It'd be the same, this is the same as a dressage whip. You never ever use your dressage whip to get your horse to go without applying a subtle aid before that, either a seat aid followed by a leg aid or whatever it is you choose to do. But the rule of the dressage whip is you can never use it on its own. 
Another rule of the dressage whip is your horse shouldn't be bothered by it. So, you know, Bundy shouldn't be bothered by this flag, even though if I ask him to go and he doesn't go to my stanzas, I can use that flag and get a lot of energy out of him. But when I ask him to stop again and I take this flag and I wave it around, he's not concerned about it, okay? Because Bundy's, Bundy's got a quite a, a, a background in don't go to bed angry. I've, I've spent a lot of time working on that. And a lot of the horses that I saw um, that were, were worried about things, that carried around a lot of baggage, you know, they worried about the wind blows, uh, they get scared of that. A car backfires, they get scared of that. All those sorts of things. Those horses are just carrying around a lot of worry and it doesn't take much to, to get them to 13 rabbits like I talked about last time. And so, you know, like I said, one of the rules with all of your tools, it doesn't matter what tool you use, if you use a lunging whip to get your horse to go, you have to make sure that the lunging whip itself does not bother your horse. Okay, you, but you're not trying to get them dead either. You want to get to where you want to get to where whatever your tool you use, you need to be able to use it when you need to. And if those horses can really understand what that tool means, and it's not a random act, okay? It doesn't just jump out of nowhere and get them, but it's there's an ask, and this is a follow-up. Your horse doesn't get worried about it, but if you just use this on its own, then anything that looks like a whip, sounds like a whip, sounds like a whip whooshing around, that sounds a bit like the wind in the trees, doesn't it? Any of those things will add to your horse's anxiety. A, uh, a friend of mine who's a very good horse trainer once said that horses feel anxiety when they feel like they have no control over what happens to them. And so it's very, very important that the horse knows how to control the dressage whip. Horse knows how to control the lunging whip. The horse knows how to control the flag. Okay, Bundy knows how to control this flag. Okay, if I ask him to go and I do that, he will go faster and then he, he knows how to make the flag go away. If I ask again and he didn't go faster, I could wave the flag and he'd give me more energy and he makes the flag go away by getting more energy. But he knows how to control the flag, so the flag does not bother him at all. Um, I've had a lot of horses in the past, like I said, you know, horses that buck, rear, bolt, spook in the wind, all those sorts of things. And those horses, anything resembling, like I said, the wind, a car backfiring, whatever, would set them off. And so teaching them how to not be worried about these tools is one of the things that teaches them how to come back down, how to not go to bed angry. So there's something you have to be very careful of doing all this stuff with horses is certain types of horses, you know, basically ones that are quite sensitive but quite stoic, you might say, can learn how to hide that from you. Okay, it's what we call shut down. And if you've ever seen a mouse being chased by a cat and the cat chases the mouse and the poor little mouse runs, but then the cat catches the mouse and they'll start to play with it. And after a while, the cat can let the mouse go and the mouse just sits there like, yeah, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. But the thing is, the mouse is not good. You look at the mouse and you go, why don't you run, little mouse, run? The mouse is not good. The mouse is actually what we call shut down. The mouse has said, I'm not here, this is not happening. La, 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 la. So he's still up. He is not down. He's not in a relaxed state. He's in a worried state, but his mind has gone elsewhere. And you have to be careful with some of these horses that they don't do that sh what we call shutdown thing. And so if you, you know, if you have a worried horse and you desensitize them a lot and they just learn to kind of stand still while you desensitize them to things, but they're not really, uh, they don't really get relaxed about it. They just appear to be relaxed. They're standing still, but they're mentally running away. Those ones can be dangerous because you think, oh, my horse is good with stuff. I've desensitized him to things. And you can be out hacking out somewhere and something happens and the horse, it, it's something big enough that the horse can't ignore it and go la 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 la. Now it's right there. And those horses really have no, uh, they've got no practice coming down for being up because when they went into that, that shutdown mode, they look like they've come down, but they haven't. And so something you can do with those horses is Bundy's asleep, come on, off you go. Something you do with those horses is you can desensitize them while moving and they will really tell you what's going on. So if they're standing still and you throw the rope over and wave the flag around, whatever it may be, they're already standing still. And if they go into that shutdown mode, they don't really tell you because I'm still standing still. Whereas if you can desensitize a horse while he's moving. So I just asked Bundy to go with this rope. I asked him and then I followed through with the rope. 
And so what I'm going to do right now that he's going around here, I'm going to take this rope and throw it over his back while he's going around here. And see, he didn't really speed up and he didn't really stop. And so he's kind of telling me, yeah, I'm, I'm good with the rope. There's one of two things he could have done right then. He could have went, oh my goodness, and he could have ran off, which means I would just keep throwing this rope over until he went, okay, it's not going to kill me. Or the other thing he could have done, he could have stopped, just froze. And if he froze, I'd ask him to go forward again and then continue throwing the rope until he can actually travel around here and be fine with that rope going over him. And, he, you know, so if, whatever he's doing right now, if you take the rope or the flag or whatever, whatever he's doing right now, whatever speed he's going at, if you take this thing and you desensitize him with it and that speed stays constant, that's a pretty good indication that the horse is not worried about it but hiding it and it doesn't matter what you are using you could you know you could use the rope you could use the flag <clears throat> off you go there Bundy you could use this uh, lunging whip right here but it's really important that you are aware that you you notice if your horse has a bit of that shut down thing I see it at clinics all around the world horses that that people have trouble with and they will you know they've learned how to basically say I'm fine Okay, and any of you gentlemen watching this will know if you uh, if you ask your wife a question sometime and she says, I'm fine, you know she's not fine. It means she's quite upset about something and she doesn't want to talk about it. And so we don't really want to get those horses to that state because they haven't come back down. Okay, and just, you know, if your wife says, I'm fine, you're pretty sure you might be going to go to bed angry. So it's something you want to be really careful of and just, if you do any desensitizing stuff make sure you can do it while your horse is moving as well as standing still because if there's if there's any shutdown stuff going on while they're standing still it will really come out and tell you when they're moving around so all of the don't go to bed angry work or the mental ups and mental downs that mental resetting that I do on the ground then when I go to under saddle I'm gonna do exactly the same thing and everything I teach these horses to do has a uh, if it has a component of responsiveness, I make sure right after that there's a component of relaxation. And for me, relaxation is the start of it. And so, you know, I want to be able to bend this horse's head and not have him move his feet. Okay, if I bend his head and he feels the need to move his feet, he's quite possibly anxious. He's probably not relaxed. You know, they're tight through their body. You know, a lot of people think their horse might be stiff, but then it can bend its head around and scratch its nose with its hind foot so they're not stiff they'd be usually a lot of times they're, they're mentally worried and so if you can get them to bend their head both ways without moving their feet that kind of tells you they're kind of relaxed I had a um I had a, uh, a really worried dressage horse a number of years ago that um, when I first rode him after I'd been through all the groundwork and stuff so he came in you know with as a problem horse and I when I first rode him the first three days I spent nothing but three days reaching down here, getting to bend his head without moving his feet, okay? Because he was always explosive and all sorts of crazy things. Did that nothing but that for three days. Because he, for my way of thinking, this horse didn't have a relaxed state. He was never relaxed. Nothing was ever relaxed about him. And so when you added more, more energy to the equation, he had, he couldn't reset back to relax. All he could reset back to is anxious anyway so it took me three days to get that bit good and by the fourth day when I actually went forward and rode him he walked trotted cantered loose rein did things he's never really done before but he had that that mental place to come back to and so when I'm training horses I really want to I really want to install the aids one at a time personally and so this here not only is it checking to see if my horse is relaxed it's working on my left rein aid are you responsive to my left rein aid does your whole body bend softly when I pick up my left rein aid on my right rein aid. Does your body bend softly when I pick up on my right rein aid? And uh, I think I've mentioned before in one of these uh, episodes that I'm riding Bundy in a Hackamore. It doesn't really matter what you ride. I mean, I just happen to like him in the Hackamore. I haven't ridden him in a Snaffle for quite a while now. So once they can do that, that's a relaxed thing. So the next aid I'm going to establish is my leg aid. Can they be responsive to my leg aid? So this here is an upward transition. So I'm just going to take my leg and slide it back there and as it makes contact with his side he should be responsive to that leg aid and when I release that leg aid he should be able to come straight back down back to that relaxed place. So that was a from relaxed to responsive and back to relaxed. Okay. He knows how to get off just my leg aid, but when I first start this, I usually carry a dressage whip and I'll lay my leg on there and if they don't get off it, I'll tap with that dressage whip. So you've got 
I'm supposed to have relaxation here, Bundy. So we've got the relaxation. I was trying to get around that side so you could see how much leg I put on. Come over here for a second, Bundy. There we go. Okay, so I've got him better. I'm going to slide my leg back. And as my leg slides back, he responds with his feet. Okay, take my leg off. He should just come back to being relaxed. I'm going to wait till he's relaxed and I'm going to let go. Shh. So under saddle, for me riding a young horse, the first time I ever move their feet, I don't move them very far and I start out relaxed and we go from relaxed to responsive and then back to relaxed again. Okay, same thing on both sides. So if he can bend his head without moving his feet, I'm going to slide my leg back and get him to move his feet. When he moves his feet, I'm going to release my leg and he's going to come back to being relaxed. For me, if a horse cannot get through this bit right here, they don't know how to reset themselves from being up just a little bit like that. They're not going to be able to reset themselves from doing something big and technical. Kind of like my wife when she had the, the uh, panic attack on the plane. So once they can do those two things, then the next thing I'm going to ask for is forward. And I'm a, I'm a big fan of like um, the classical French dressage way of looking at things. Leg without hand, hand without leg. When I'm asking my horse to go forward initially, so I've already taught him how to get off this leg and how to get off this leg. Then I'm going to use both legs simultaneously and he goes forward. But I'm probably not going to go very far. So that's leg without hand. I'm not going to go very far. And then I'm going to make sure that he hasn't got too far from the relaxed state. So I'm going to bend him around and wait for him to come back to a stop. So if there's any rabbits in there right now, those rabbits are being removed. And right now there's no rabbits. And we're back again. So that downward transition was hand without leg. That upward transition was leg without hand. So then I go again and ask him to go. And, you know, Bundy's been ridden for quite a while, but if this is a young horse on its first ride, and I was, say, in the round pen or whatever, I wouldn't be steering. I would just let them go wherever they want to go. And when I want to stop, I just reach down, bend their head around, and let them come to a stop. It's not a, er, I'm making a stop. It's, can you find the stop? Because at slow speeds, it is very easy to tell your horse, I want you to stop right now. But you may leave some anxiety in there. So when I bend, bend these horses to a stop initially, so how I get to a stop is I bend them to a stop. When I actually bend them to a stop, I'm just going to wait for them to stop. I don't care if it takes them 10 minutes to, to come to a stop. I'm just going to wait until they find that stop that I'm going to let go. So I'm guaranteeing that I'm going from relaxed to responsive, back to relaxed, even at the walk. Some horses can't even do that. Once I start trotting, it's the same thing. I'll have them trot, and when I want to stop, I'm just going to reach down here, bend them around, and wait for them to just come back to a walk, then a stop, and then I will let go. And there's no leg in that downward transition. They've already got forward motion, okay? So I'm, I do a lot from the walk, I do a lot from the trot. And by the time you get to the canter, it, usually it's not hard to have them come back down again. So, you know, if you're riding a green horse and you're trotting along here and you go for a bit of a canter, you should be able to then reach down, just bend him around, just wait for him to... And there's a lot of reasons I do that. Mostly it is for the benefit of the relaxation. They come back down. But the other thing, I mean, there's a lot of mechanical stuff, a lot of biomechanical stuff I'm teaching them. But as you guys would know, if you pick up on two reins on a horse and they're perfectly stiff, like straight stiff, they can push on you. As soon as you put a bend in their body, they cannot brace against you. And so if you think about every downward transition I've done, the walk to halt downward transition, the trot to walk to halt downward transition, and the Canada trot to walk halt downward transition, they've all been quite fluid and, and at no point in time has the horse stiffened up on my hand or braced his legs. I'll just go for a bit of a canter here again. So just cantering along here, I'm just, just watch his, if you watch his legs, his feet go dun 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 Dun, dun, and he comes to a stop. I'm not having very good luck with him stopping pointing at the camera today, am I? He keeps stopping facing away from the camera. Um, but once we're back down here, he is now back down. He's now reset himself. And I think that's the big thing that most people, almost every problem horse I see around the world, the horse, once they get up, 
can't come back down. If I ever talk to like eventers, a lot of the problems they say is I want to get in the cross country course, I can't, you know, I can't slow him down. And, and you know, if you think about eventers, they are, they are going at high speeds towards a rather large jump that does not move. And if you can't regulate their stride going up to that jump, you know, if they're, they're, they're too mentally up and they're pulling on your hands and you can't regulate that stride, I imagine that gets pretty dangerous right there. So hopefully that gives you some idea of the importance of the principle that I call don't go to bed angry and the ability for those horses to control their emotions. Don't forget to join us next time we'll look at another principle of training. Um, horses, can you get out of the camera? I'm supposed to be Hello. I'm supposed to be talking. Get, get, get out of the camera. <coughs> Welcome back to the principles of training. Today we are going to talk about the principle of don't go to bed angry.